given in the brochure and uh, I will leave you to moderate it amongst yourself after that. So, Rochelle de Silva writes about her travels, cultural influences and personal experiences. Her poems furnished with breath. Uh, her poems furnished with deep imagery and functional metaphors provide clear pathways into her world and her ethos. She's been a part of numerous literary festivals like the Bengaluru Poetry Festival, Poets Translating Poets Festival, Kala Goda Arts Festival, and Pre the Femme International Poetry and Arts Festival. She curates a monthly poetry open mic in Mumbai called Words Tell Stories that feature local and international artists and runs a slam series called Mumbai Poetry Slam. She has released a poetry and music album titled Best Apology Face that is available on Bandcamp and iTunes. Her debut collection of poetry titled When Home is an Idea is available on uh, Amazon. She endorses hugs. I'll claim mine later. <laughs> Shelley Boyle lives in India and Brazil. In addition to her debut poetry book, An Ember from Her Pyre, she has published academic papers and poetry in over two dozen books and journals. She brought out with Sering Shakya the news India edition of Tibetan Writings in English in 2014. Her forthcoming publications include two co-edited volumes, Resistant Hybridities, Tibetan Narratives in Exile, and Negotiating Dispossession, Tibetan Subjectivities on a Global Stage. Uh, she has received the Commendation Prize in All India Poetry Competition 2016, third prize in Rabindranath Tagore International Poetry Prize in 2016, and first place in Tavo Safe Alliance Writing Contest and honorable mention in FLEFF Checkpoint Story Contest of Itaka University. Uh, our third poet here is Brian Mendonca. Mendonca. He has self-published two volumes of verse, a piece of India poems in transit and last bus to Vasco points from Goa. After a decade in Delhi in school publishing, he returned to his roots in Goa. He writes a weekly column, On My Mind, in the weekender section of Romantha Times every Sunday. He currently teaches language and literature in Kamen College, Tume. He lives in Porvori with his wife and son. The fourth poet is Anupama Raju. We're not sure she has reached yet. So, I suggest we uh, start the conversation with the three of you and we have about uh, 40 minutes, 35 to 40 minutes uh, to listen to your poetry. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody here. Afternoon. The first poem that I'm going to uh, recite is called Masala Chai in Brazil. This poem is a fusion of my uh, experience of being Indian in Brazil, my Indianness and the overwhelming, or I would say, invading Brazilianness. <laughs> so I'm a very bad singer, and I warn you, this poem has some lines that I'm going to sing, and if it hurts your ears, it's like your own risk. My kitchen is a little India, is an island invaded by aromatic waves of roasted coffee beans riding on strums of guitar played on my neighbor's radio in Brazil. A vida vem in on the comar, colonizing me from a tongue root tension to begin with. At AIMS and PMs, every day I take refuge 
in my masala chai that tickles the ingenuous on my tongue and brings in the Lata or the Mukesh. Between the slow slurps of tea from a Chinese mug, reflection of the setting sun thrown into the golden tinge of turmeric stewed with tea leaves, stealing between my mother's secret condiments and oh, the divine basil she watered each day by the waking eye of the sky, clad in a sari like Asha Parekh in the song, often hummed in our fragrant courtyard until time fell us all apart. A dried leaf or two, a dried leaf or two I pick up and brew in my tea every day at AMs and PMs, sometimes over long distant calls, sometimes over long distant calls on long dead phone numbers, ringing deep into the sips from my mug of masala chai that keeps me warm like the fur of my mother's embrace on cold days and nights, flipping over and over on my isolated island, my little India, invaded by aromatic waves of roasted coffee beans, riding on strums of guitar, a vita veriranda kumar, which means life comes in waves like it were the sea, played on my neighbor's radio in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you for being here, listeners. I uh, share the note of uh, somberness with which the festival started uh, because uh, we remember two people who have left us and this first poem is someone who has left me, my father. So it's a short poem and I'd like to start with uh, Vanity. Uh, it's taken from the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, Vanity of Vanities as a Preacher. So, it's a very short poem, but it uh, is the essence of what I was going through at that time. Vanity. Today I tire not of waiting. My father has been gathered to his fathers. And so will I one day. Of what merit is it to rush unbidden when everything comes down to a speck? Thank you. Okay, so um, I had this idea that we were all doing about seven, eight minutes each um, and not alternating. So I might just, I planned something with a bit of a flow, so I hope you don't mind listening to me a bit longer. Um, it's, it's beautiful to be here, to be uh, reading poetry in Goa means a lot, especially. Um, because I'm very good, except that I live in Mali. Um, this book of poems, it's, it, it deals with <laughs> questions of identity and belonging, which is why it's called When Home is an Idea. Um, and this po poem is called, Where Are You From? Even here, in the midst of familiar mannerisms, Skin tones that are proof that fairness creams lie. In the potholed streets where pot-bellied uncles and aunties complain about the unfairness of it all. In the brightly lit malls that serve as beacons 
to the city's people, over dinners with progressive friends and liberal strangers, at poetry readings and comedy nights and concerts, while too much whiskey has been drunk, or polite salads neatly portioned, over the internet, where conversation must be made and social anxiety curbed, in the midst of movie marathons and game nights, even here, I am asked, where are you from? Where are you based? Which piece of land, which area, which zip code, which border defines you? about, I feel like this poem encompasses that. It's called The Curse of the Eternally Displaced. Allow me another helping of denial while I let myself believe that I will be back. Allow me to shake off the nagging certainty that back never means the same thing before lives only in memory. Right now is always slightly worse off than then. And the future is always hidden under murky waters. Give me your silence while I make grand plans to walk your streets again. Don't ask well-meaning questions about how. While my skin betrays me, by not recognizing the weather of the place I used to call home. This humid is not like that humid, and no one ever gets used to the rain. Allow me my dark clouds of contemplation, my infectious silence that can corrupt the liveliest celebration, my pregnant pauses that do not birth magic. Leave me to my memory palace, to building walls and trap doors to the ghosts and the ghouls tainted by a repressed desire to belong. How uncool it is to be wandering, to be in so many places at once, to put all this effort into remembering and still feel alien when I return. Thank you. So I'm primarily a spoken word poet. It's very hard for me to be still and read poetry. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'm going to do a couple of spoken word pieces. Um, and I think we're a bit spoiled in the performance space or in the, uh, the you know, at the spoken word space because um, we encourage our audiences to be a bit more vocal, <laughs> a bit more reactive. So I'm going to let you in on this. If um, you're listening to a spoken word performance, and if you like a line or a phrase or something, uh, I would encourage you to click. Um, works in two ways. It lets the, the poet know that, that you're listening and that you're, you like what they're, what they're reading or performing. And uh, it keeps you awake to listen. So, okay. Okay, I think I'm going to start with one called Adrak Chai because of your Chai poem. It um, brought this one back to me. I'm an avid Chai drinker and a coffee drinker. I don't know how that works, but I'm a tea and a coffee star. Um, anyway, this one's called Adrak Chai. He insists on making the tea. It is the only thing he knows how to cook, so I let him. He watches over the pot like a hawk, leaving it to simmer on a low flame, throwing in all the ingredients at once, even sugar. I already know that it will be too sweet or too milky, steeped for too long, boiled, well past perfection. The outcome is always different though. When we're in the middle of a fight, 
It is as if even the tea throws a tantrum, changing to a rusty, sour concoction that he drinks in one gulp and I leave idling on the nightstand. There were days, though, when the mood was just right, when the water and the tea leaves came together in unison and we were happy. These days, I've taken to drinking strong Adra Chai, purging my insides of the memory of him. The cup with the fish motifs picked up at the local flea market, the addition to my expanding collection, dropped to the floor accidentally. The tea is never milky now. It is sharp and concentrated, just like my thoughts brew just the way I like it. Shared with friends who understand that it is an elixir, a fountain of healing gift wrapped in an old wives' tale, a messenger that holds my fortune in the shallow pool of a teacup. And as I sip my one cup meditation in the confines of my room, my eyes misty from the hot steam, my eager tongue lightly singed. I can't help but feel renewed. Thank you. One last one and I'm done. Um, this is one of the first pieces I ever did. Um, I understand the need for titles, but I really suck at writing titles for poems. Um, so I thought I was being really clever when I titled this one. I have perfect bottle opening hands. If I had known that the last time I held you or saw you or kissed you would be the last time, I would have held you longer, closer, harder, pressed against my memory like the roots of a 200 year old sycamore trying to break free from the concrete pavements that line the streets of my mind. I would have remembered every color, every shape, every contour, every breath. See, I always wondered what they meant. Those people who are scared to forget, always regretting what they lost. I've never regretted a single moment shared with you, never held back and given you just enough. I've always known that Someday you might turn around and walk away. Someday. Not a faraway thought, but this real, constant, everyday feeling. One must always be prepared because anything can happen to anyone. And because something was kind enough to happen to us. And greed. And greed is but the cause of all evil. So I don't want all of you forever. I want everything that you will willingly give me until someday you won't. From the first moment I stole your breath using your exhales to fuel mine, I remember the way your skin felt against the jagged edge of my elbow. The way my toes seek you out in its blankets, the way I'm spent in your presence, the way you make me glow like some extraterrestrial life form with a secret that mere marbles cannot comprehend. The way you make me want to sit back and observe instead of participate until we decide when to crawl inside each other's heads again and wear each other's skin and just sit still, barely touching, and call it comfortable, or even just fucking awesome. I remember stealing your thoughts without your consent, watching you cringe when my eyes read your musings, these barely imperceptible twitches that give you away. The not-so-subtle fluctuations of my cornea and my brow and my very stupid expressive face that keeps me away but watching you cringe now because we do not have control over everything and as much control as I have given you, I don't give you control over this. I don't let you decide what you can or cannot do to me and how much and for how long because I, I am perfectly capable of carrying you. Like a woman walking through a desert with earthen pots stacked on her head, staying steady, staying strong, balancing pain and need and want and desire against her flimsy neck, bracing her spine for more because she knows the value of an earthen pot and I, I'm perfectly capable of carrying you with me into my tomorrow because whoever thought that you and I don't fit or look great together or I'm going to last, they're all wrong. Because you and I, 
we're not the byproducts of someone else's conjecture, someone else's approval or lack thereof. And this, this is the best idea I've had in my 52-year-old existence. So if age and weed and dementia will not destroy us, what makes you think you can? Thank you so much. Wow! Where she said her mother conceived her, 
and we walk all the places where her mother used to work, her mother lived. So to that and daughter, to my friend Sarin Vahadurupa, she builds a stupa of words for her mother, a Tibetan daughter. She walks all day in distant lands, imaging the places of conception and birth. She greets her mother in the elements of physical existence on earth. Shape of a tree, feel of the rain, whispers in the wind, glow of other lamps, even her wedding ring. <coughs> she feels, she feels her mother's hands on the beads of the rosary. Now she tells, in common faith she twins. A Tibetan daughter, a Tibetan daughter with ruts in exile, wish tree. She flips through pages of an alternate history. The stateliness of a chieftain, grandfather, enmeshed life of a princess, exile of a nation, the snow land to which she returns her mother in ashes. A Tibetan Shabna Kumar, a Tibetan Shabna Kumar carries in her heart her mother. Each day, each day she lights a lamp of thought soaked in butter from her memory chest of a score and fall. Each day she lights a lamp of thought soaked in butter from her memory chest of a score and fall and offers it to the stupa of words she builds for her. dedicated to her mother. So, now the next poem I am going to read is called Borrowing the Bardo. Now you see that uh, my, in my poem for Sunning, I am idolizing her as a wedding daughter. But I am not idolizing her. Yeah? I am not romanticizing her in a way that I feel her identity into something which is just very unreal. Uh, borrowing, why I am saying this is because Borrowing the Bardo is a kind of a related poem. Bardo is the very famous Tibetan book of the dead, or Bardo Poro in English, the Tibetan book of the dead. So, uh, what happened when Tibetans came into exile in 1959? A lot of people from the West came to help Tibetans, but not only to help Tibetans, but also to have access through the exiled Tibetans to the mysterious land of Tibet, which was inaccessible to them, and where Dharma was preached, where the Bodhisattva lived in the Dalai Lama and uh, where monks were, would fly in the air and do all kinds of exotic things. So what has happened with this kind of uh, understanding or sort of, you know, this kind of representation of Tibet that the Tibetan cause of exile, the political cause of Tibetan exile has become peripheral, it has become secondary. So this kind of romanticism around Tibet is something that a scholar confronts. I have been, I've been a PhD on Tibetan fiction, Tibetan English fiction, so I would go to the Dhanasala, I belong to that place, my native place of the Dhanasala. So when I would go to, go to the librarian, so this is a dialogue between a Tibetan librarian and a Indian scholar. So this forms a dialogue and in between dialogue, uh, there is also an internal dialogue. And uh, sort of you know, something that I speak to myself, so maybe I just want to tell you that now I am talking internally to only myself. Okay, so good. See the Tibetan intellectuals, they are very upset about the romanticism of Tibet. Because they say that, you know, we have a reason to be exiled. It's a political reason. Just understand that. So this poem is Borrowing the Bard. But we have slant eyes and flat noses, he said. But we have slant eyes and flat noses, he said. Wish I had your eyes and nose, I evidenced. Clapping eyelids in the rat bed and fingers his ring and interfering nose. He simpered, he simpered, furling up a long silken sleeve. The traditional Tibetan dress, they have very long sleeves. He simpered, furling up a long silken sleeve and reaching out to the bar to on a regulated shelf, a muttered sort of ghost. Of a region of mistress to romancers and, and of gods are pampered rats, perhaps lost to, I added. Think of offerings to stone gods while some empty stomachs churn inside out. 
It's written to slip my tongue if I speak of the milk ruminating. What? My tongue hurt. It's all about karma, people dying, denied. He took a rather exhausted breath. The pundit, the monk, the father, and Charles. Either well done or under, I thought. Faith in karma, I do not mean to disdain. Faith finds its heart. Faith finds also in the heart of doers, the farmers and earthworms working the soil, the trees holding the ground. I am just not a gentle person, I dare declare. It's how you like to see the other side of the perceptible mountain from this window. How it is is relative to perception. He slurred his brother team and gazed at the snow peaks. Some things like an earthing, a maternal surname. Some things like an earthing, a maternal surname, not the one my mother had from her father. Not the one my mother had from her father is not an unthinking but a shallow dive. The mountains spread to me the spiritual and religious. Faith is personal, rituals social. So you reckon? I ask you. So you reckon? Ah, such cosmopolitan fashionable phrases are not for us. Us whose lives are destined to be recollected, exasperated. That stretched he, handing me Bardo Todor. That, that is a tragedy of having to be a nation Tragedy, perhaps, of not having a nation.
the land of bricks, where many are gallant, but others just bricks, where you can take a ride with time on your side, get stoned, get honed, with nowhere to hide. The hillside is barren, the workers disaffected. No jobs, no food. Is it rhyme, wine, or mine? Come the pretty girls, their allure holds sway. When the night is done, keep us thy deed at bay. Enjoy the season, the charters have arrived, it's festive times and galfing times. Goa's greener, not anymore. Pretty, hot now, the rents do show. Thank you. <laughs> that last part was in galfing times, right? Yeah, so yeah, this is yeah. Galf 17. <laughs> Anybody like to ask anything or comment or? Sorry, that that poem which you recited last was so phenomenal, and the way you did it. And you're saying it's your first poem? Did I hear that right? It's the first spoken word poem I ever wrote. Wonderful. I mean, I'm just amazed. So, is is there a chance to share it? Is there a chance to share it on email or something? It was really very intense. I'm, I mean, it woke me up. Is there in this book? No, that's what I was. In the bio, there's a spoken word album, so it's poetry and music together. Yeah. And it's a You're very talented, I must say. Thank you. scribbling poet at times so do you have any tips any ideas or you want to share about how you got into poetry and probably that could help me to start you know sharing my scribblings I think all of you if you would like to share about it I don't know yeah started and the reason is that you started scribbling so you need to just get back to look at what you're scribbling and ask yourself why you're scribbling what you're scribbling and that's the first step. Any questions? I think it's very subjective you know uh, I wrote my first poem when I was in class 8 and then I got back writing poetry in college. Like, what really helps write poetry is encouragement. Of course you need solitude to write poetry but you also need to have com you need to com have commerce of ideas with people like attending events, reading more poems, writing the poems, sharing it with your friends, taking feedback from them. I myself am a spreading poet so I don't think I can tell you much. <laughs> I'm just like a, a one book poet, you know. That's it. Um, my rule in life in general, or with poetry, uh, with anything you do is no disclaimers, no apologies, no preambles. If you believe in what you're doing, you're already selling it. You don't, you don't need anybody else to validate it. So come back to the why. Why are you writing? What do you have to say? And that's it. So when you put it forward to somebody, even if you're reading for the first time, Floyd, please don't go up and say, this is my first time reading, it is my first poem, please be nice to me. Just read. That's it. I think uh, poetry is all about conviction, Floyd, and all the poets here. Yeah. Because I think we are all poets, we've just not expressed what we want to say. Um, 
So, uh, you keep writing and don't throw those scraps of paper away. So one day like me, you put them all together and publish them. The most happening adjective in my bio data is self-published poem. I'm not saying it uh, with all the connotations that uh, move around. I'm saying if I didn't believe in myself, I wouldn't have been able to publish those poems. And now it doesn't matter what they think of the poems. Because that is what I wanted to do and I'm here where I am. How do you self-publish? Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask, uh, Rochelle, you do a lot of performance poetry, right? Is there a future in that? Is there really scope for performance poetry in our country? Absolutely. For Speak it to the mic. <laughs> I think um, India is just awakening to this idea of spoken word poetry um, started by being very uh, not trusting, not looking at it as an art form, considering it to be just the wild ramblings of young kids. Um, I, I see that there is a future in India because there is so much that hasn't even been tapped into. So at the moment you have open mics, you're starting to have poetry slams where, where poets are coming and expressing themselves. But performance poetry is poetry that does not want to, refuses to sit on a page. You can put it with music, you can put it with dance, you can put it with, you can get a whole jazz band and an orchestra going behind you. Um, you can have props, you can create a, a, an entire show out of it. Um, and you get to be and live your poems. There is so much scope for what you can do, whether you're doing installations, whether you're just standing on the street and reading poetry with like just a mic and an amp. There are so many things that you can do. Also, why it works is because it's so accessible, it's so conversational, it's so accessible. Um, you're, you're taking your audience on a journey. Um, and so definitely I see a scope. Um, in fact, I think Performance poetry is going to carve that space out for itself, regardless of what people's ideas of it are. Anyway. I think Rochelle, actually, we as uh, as a country have always had performance poetry. You know, the old stories, mythological stories, are all narrated. Exactly. We have an oral tradition. What is happening now is that we're accepting that beyond mythology and history, there is another uh, area which can be explored, which is the internal yeah. universe. And people we don't know or have never heard of can share that universe and touch your universe with theirs. I think it's beautiful. And in a, in a, in a situation where people are reading so little, the spoken word has to be the word that they will hear. I think it's beautiful. It was easy for me to self-publish because I worked in presses for a lot, lot of my time. I was with Oxford, with uh, Britannica, and with Cambridge. But it is not that difficult to publish. Uh, we can speak about it. Uh, you basically need to have at least 80 poems ready. 80. 8 zero. That is after editing them. How do you bring out a volume? And uh, you need to have that many poems because they've got to make up the bulk of a book. Otherwise, it will be too thin to print it. So unless you've got, say, 100 poems or 150 and pare it down to 80, you're not going anywhere. So like I told Floyd, keep writing. Tomorrow somebody will come and tell you that's really good. Um, you put them all together, you sequence them, you give them to people who can 
uh, give you an objective viewpoint, give it a title, and uh, a lot of presses around will just take it. You don't have to go to a branded press. You can go to a normal press. Any press that does your school magazines, or as long as they give you good quality, and uh, you get someone to write forward, you need to put around say 25, 30 thousand for a 500 print run, and that's a little conservative. Say 40 thousand for 500 copies, hardback, which is good. Get you on your way. One, one question. I just want to. All right. I just want to add to what he's saying one moment. Yesterday we had a book of, book of poems and that was self-published by Sal. So, yeah. Very quick question. You said 80 poems or did you mean 80 pages? I read one poem on one page. So that would be 40 pages. 40 pages. Yeah. I could give you a form of 80 pages. Yeah. But depends, depends whether someone will buy that book. You're looking at market. That's very important. Market. You're self publishing. You need someone to buy those books. So make it attractive for them. Okay, I'm going to cut you both off now at this point. Sorry. As we have the next speakers already here. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, Shelley, Rochelle. You brought the art into Gallery.